The party is over for Matara 1994, but while the clean-up may be a dirty job, it seems it was worth it. Crowds have been well up on expectations, the people of Newcastle getting behind their festival. Over the nine days um, we saw huge crowds, certainly um, well above any other year. Over its 33 year history, Matara has had a chequered success rate with some questioning its survival. But this year the festival pulled in the crowds and more importantly their money. It's estimated more than two million dollars was spent in the CBD and that must mean Matara's future looks bright. Matara has been around for 33 years so obviously it's been through a few cycles um, but we, we are very confident that, uh, that we're on an up cycle at the moment. Pastor Moglu was having talks with St George and Eastern Suburbs, but has decided against a return to the Winfield Cup competition. Along with fellow front rower Jim Bell, Pastor Moglu will re-sign with the Scorpions tomorrow. At this stage, Toronto's only loss is hooker Brett Pennell, who is now in England with the Australian police team. Pennell will play with Central Charlestown next season, while Toronto fullback Gavin Cook is trialling with several clubs in Sydney. The Scorpions have also signed former Australian schoolboy centre Jason Ford. Meantime, Newcastle competitors have dominated the first round of the Australian Barefoot Water Ski Championships in Kempsey. Trevor Russo won the unlimited, unrestricted event, while Bruce Fields took out the veterans. Natalie Mabry was successful in the women's, while Michael Stewart won the juniors. Newcastle will host the third round of the championships next month. Police comforted the five-year-old boy late yesterday after he'd been wandering for hours near where his father had tragically died. It's believed 39-year-old Norman Smith, a French-Canadian, was going fishing with his son when he slipped off this railway bridge and fell five metres. He apparently hit his head on rocks and drowned in 15 centimetres of water in Narara Creek. A teenager found the body and alerted Gosford police. The dead man's son was found in a playground about 500 metres away. The child is now with his mother in a caravan park. The family has been in Australia for three months. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Mention handball in Australia and most people will tell you it's a schoolyard pastime played with a tennis ball on a square of concrete. But the real handball, the European version, is played on a court 40 by 20 metres with a team of seven and has been a popular Olympic sport for more than 50 years. While there are a few teams throughout the country, the Adamstown Rosebuds has become the first registered club in Australia. Several of the Rosebud soccer players were trying out the sport, which the State Soccer Federation is backing. With Sydney to stage the year 2000 games, those behind handball are attempting to bolster its forces in the hope of having a competitive team. The Hunter is now being targeted for players, with the school's training camp to be held on the 19th and 20th of December. This photo of 27-year-old Peter Brendan Jones has been released by his family in an effort to get fresh information in what is proving to be a frustrating case. The investigation has stagnated at this stage and we need a lot more help from the public. Police have interviewed family and friends of Peter Jones to try and establish a motive for the crime, but they admit they still have little to go on. 
Jones was shot in this backyard just over a week ago after he went to investigate why the power was cut to his Toralba house. He was shot twice by a man wearing a balaclava, one bullet hitting him in the arm, the other cutting his spinal cord at the neck. The young man was to be married in just over a month. He could now be a quadriplegic. After a week of intensive investigations, it may be Jones who offers the vital clue to why he was shot. Hopefully sometime this week we'll get down there to see him. Uh, he's still on the respirator and uh, subject to doctor's orders and uh, wishes we'll interview him. Anybody with information should contact Toronto Police. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. Already on a playing scholarship with Newcastle, Craigie last Friday signed an upgraded playing contract with the Knights. Five days earlier, he'd clinched a one-year deal with the Raiders. Canberra has registered the contract with the league and is keen to pursue the matter. Newcastle's Brad Mellon is hoping to discuss the issue tomorrow with Canberra's Kevin Neal and Craigie in Sydney following a chief executives meeting. But the Knights have reiterated their determination to keep one of the nation's best young players. We have a legally binding contract. If Canberra continue on, the only player that will, the only thing that will lose will be Owen because it will go through the, the legal system and, and that can take a long period of time. To motorsport, and Wyong's Damon Buckmaster has won the final two races in the 600cc Shell Supersport Series at Victoria's Phillip Island. His efforts weren't enough to haul in championship leader Newcastle's Graham Morris, who took out the championship by five points with Buckmaster second. And in 10-pin bowling, Newcastle competitors have finished first and second in the Australian Women's Masters Tournament in Brisbane. Cardiff's Sharon McLeish finished second behind Edgeworth's Anne-Marie Putney, who finished with a 203 average. Instead of paint, flour, water bombs and... A ...war fought in the lounge room over 20 years ago. But for Vietnam veterans, it's a real-life battle they must face every day. Today that fight was eased for about 100 local veterans who gathered at Raymond Terrace Council to meet with Minister for Veteran Affairs, Con Shaka. Veterans voiced their concerns, a major problem being a breakdown in communication with the Department of Veteran Affairs. Veterans are also frustrated over perceived rises in medication for war-related illnesses. But Minister Shaka says this problem, and others, can be overcome. Vietnam veterans in particular, in the past, have not really had, a, I believe, a, a good deal from successive governments. Uh, it's only been over the last four or five years that we've recognised that post-traumatic stress disorder is a problem that really needs to be looked at and looked at seriously. Twenty million dollars is to be spent over the next five years for young veterans, with emphasis on the management of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Despite the meeting turning hostile several times, veterans say the minister of only five months could be a change for the better. Frustration more than anything else is basically that um, we haven't been supported at all. Uh, by uh, Department of Affairs, probably only the last five years they've, they've, we consider them to be to be fair income to holding out. Uh, the Prime Minister, um, who implemented all this thing, has now more or less dumped it on uh, on Con's um, lap holding out. And I think he's doing a good job. Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to congratulate him. Jim Callanan, NBN News.
the last time I saw this many photographers, the Prince and Princess of uh, Wild. A similar break-in occurred at the bowling club this time last year when a significant amount of money was stolen from the poker machines. This morning's break-in occurred just after one o'clock. The offenders smashed a back window to get into the building. A security camera captured the robbery which was completed in just over one minute. The drawers to 11 poker machines were prized open and $3,500 in coins stolen. Police are hopeful it will lead to the identity of two men in their 20s. Apparently they're a, a part of a gang that's operating up and down the coast at uh, different periods and um, I, yes, I hope the police do get some substantial lead and uh, some arrests in the future. The club president says security may have to be stepped up. The loss comes at a time when the club is attempting to expand its facilities. A new foyer and dining room are planned along with the possibility of an extra bowling green. Tracy Walsh, NBN News. The top 32 seeds in the Classic were on show for the first time today in messy one and a half to two metre waves. The day started well for Newcastle, with Darren Burgess advancing to tomorrow morning's fourth round after finishing second in the first heat of round three. Another Novocastrian and defending champion, Adam Player, has also qualified in the final 32, while several of the top seeds, such as Bo Young, were surprisingly eliminated. Other locals successfully through include Craig McMillan, Andy Brinkworth, Mitchell Dawkins and Justin Lee. Tomorrow's semi-finals start at 11.30 with the final due to get underway at 12.15. Meantime, the Port Hunter Club has trifected this afternoon's Tui 16-foot skiff handicap on Newcastle Harbour. On handicap, the Phantom, skippered by Jeff Riley, was first, followed by Kim and Awesome, with Beechwood Home skippered by Belmont's John Miller taking line honours. Despite the inclement weather conditions, around 2,000 spectators welcomed the region's latest national team at Marathon Stadium and they weren't disappointed. Pitcher Neil Webber restricted the Blues early, while Brett Schleider gave the Eagles a 5-1 lead with this home run after similar blows from Sam Grant and Jeff Blum. 
Import Blom continued to frustrate Sydney, making four trips round the diamond during the night, while teammate Todd Legrand also gave the growing number of fielders on the hill plenty of practice. That gave the Eagles a 10-3 victory, sending mascot Eddie into a frenzy. This afternoon, another doubleheader was played, Sydney setting a league record when they trounced the Eagles 17 runs to one. A short time ago, the second game was still in progress. Newcastle Beach provided a two metre surf for round two. Rookie Philip Clayton going to an early lead in the swim, which he sustained for the first third of the race before losing it on the ski. On his heels were Hayden Reese, Guy Andrews, and Trevor Hendy, with Hendy winning that battle and establishing what appeared to be a minute winning break. A mistake by Andrews proved costly, but a change in fortune saw Hendy brought back to the field, then battered in the final ski leg with Dwayne Tice, allowing Andrews and Jay Gilbert to pass the pair. It developed into a sprint finish, Andrews only drawing clear in the final 50 metres. Meantime, North Burley's Reen Corbett won the Devondale Women's Marathon event this morning, ahead of pre-race favourite Carla Gilbert. Renowned for a prowess on the board, Corbett took full advantage of a favoured leg, completing the course in just under 39 minutes. And in the surfboat final, Alexandra Heads beat Manly. Personnel on the Rath base at Williamtown were stunned by the Mackies crash. I think they'll be buying a lottery ticket, I would. Three Mackies had been involved in a routine air combat training mission. Somehow two of the planes, piloted by Flying Officer Liam Pulford and Flying Officer Mark Connolly, collided at 3,000 metres. Within seconds they'd ejected to safety. The third Mackie pilot made a mayday call to search for and rescue the two men. At a special news conference, the group captain John Kindler confirmed both pilots were transported back to the base in excellent health. Both pilots uh, who were who both ejected successfully from their aeroplanes are in the hospital right now, undergoing routine medical checks. They're fine and smiling. Connolly and Paulford are in the 76th squadron. At just 24 years old, both men are respected pilots. They have uh, just completed what we call the introductory fighter course in the last few months and uh, they're waiting to go to either F-111s or F-18s. Following the crash, the Williamtown base now has 27 Mackies. The 30-year-old planes are used for advanced training. The jets said to handle particularly well and were once used in the stunt roulette team. The Mackies have been the centre of previous RAF investigations. In 1992, the fleet was grounded when wing fatigue cracks were found in some of the planes. While the cause of this crash is not yet known, it's not thought to be a structural problem. A special investigation has begun. A team of experts from Canberra flew to the accident site this afternoon. Peter Ryan, NBN News. After the hectic finish yesterday, it was a more leisurely departure from Foster this morning for the trip to Nelson Bay. After yesterday's disappointment, Germany's Bosch team put on the early pressure, causing plenty of concern. Race leader Kelvin Martin conceding after the stage, his AIS team almost threw the race away by not covering the Germans' early attacks. Cheered on by hundreds of locals lining the course, the Australians eventually got things together. In a sprint finish, Australian Jamie Drew was able to hold off the European challenge, with Martin keeping the yellow jersey ahead of fellow countryman Matt White and teammate Robbie McEwen. 
Newcastle's Darren Jones also remains in contention, currently in fifth place, 57 seconds off the pace. Another long day awaits competitors tomorrow, with the 142 kilometre hike from Nelson Bay to Singleton, followed by a nighttime criterium around the Bayswater power station. A giant cake is enough to bring a smile to many at face and at Charlestown Square today students from Charlestown Primary School had little trouble mustering a grin. With sporting stars like the Falcons Michael Johnson and Derek Rucker and the Knights Robbie O'Davis on hand to help, it took little effort to get all involved. The occasion was the launch of National Smile for Life Day held this Friday. The event is the major fundraising day for the largely self-funded life education units. From 76 bases throughout Australia, they teach drug awareness and healthy lifestyle programs to school children. To support Hunter Life Education, badges can be purchased from various venues, including Woolworths and NIB. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. Mr Alexander was a widower with two children when he married his second wife Janine. Just before last Christmas, he shot her through the head while she lay in bed at their Central Coast home. During his trial in Newcastle Supreme Court, evidence was given that he'd done it because she'd treated the two children from his first marriage appallingly for a decade. Such was her dislike for them, she had wanted Paul to have them adopted. Justice Hunt today said Mr Alexander committed the crime only when stretched beyond his endurance by the conduct of the deceased. While the existence of provocation doesn't justify the killing, it meant he wasn't convicted of murder. Paul Alexander was found guilty of manslaughter. Today, Justice Hunt sentenced him to two and a half years in a minimum security jail. The parents of Janine Alexander were not present at the sentencing. However, they believe he should have served life in prison. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Most of us take the truckies and road transport workers for granted, but one group is hoping to give the industry a new boost. This morning, the Hunter Valley Transport Training Organisation launched a traineeship for transport workers, the first course of its type in New South Wales. It will be brought in from January next year at the Industry Development Centre next to Newcastle University. It's a one-year course, including such subjects as customer relations, freight import and export procedures, handling dangerous goods. And this is just the start. It would be great to see the universities pick up the cudgel and go along and make it a real profession by offering a degree in transport.
They've been preparing for this day all year, 31 of Australia's most beautiful young women. During the week they'd been under the critical eye of judges and last night it culminated in a glittering pageant at the Gold Coast Arts Centre. The girls paraded in evening wear, cocktail dresses and of course swimwear. After a tense wait, the judges made their choice. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for our winner for 1994, Jacqueline Shooter. Jacqueline, who lives in Southport, is a full-time model, and with this title to her name, her future is virtually assured. The house in Regal Way, Valentine, burst into flames soon after three this morning. Fire units were called, but there was little they could do. Both floors of the building were ablaze in a matter of minutes. Flames lit up the night sky, the fire visible from kilometres away. Neighbours were awoken by a huge explosion. We thought it was an earthquake, and when we ran outside, we just saw just the whole house next door had been engulfed in flames, and we just started running out of the house, just had no time to think. My wife and I just ran. Investigators are almost certain it was arson. The home is owned by a former policeman who was a sergeant at Wall's End. Detectives are investigating the possibility that someone may hold a grudge against him. It's thought some kind of flammable liquid was used to ignite the blaze. Gas pipes inside the building may have been left on. The arsonist risking his life to light the fire. Some of the neighbours have reported seeing a male um, just after the explosion running away from the house. This morning there was little left of the $250,000 home. Only brick walls remained standing. The damaged garage door, evidence of the powerful explosion. The house was unoccupied at the time of the fire. The owner of the property is on holidays in Queensland. Police have been unable to contact him. Peter Ryan, NBN News. This is why Edgeworth's Anne-Marie Putney is Australia's best lady bowler. In 1986-87, Anne-Marie was the country's top junior, but didn't really continue this dominating form in the senior ranks. This year, she has, winning all before her, including the Australian Masters, the Melbourne Cup, the International Classic in New Zealand, and a silver medal for Australia at the Asian Zone Championships in Guam. Two weeks ago, she was crowned national number one. The 24-year-old says she hasn't really changed her technique, just the way she motivates herself while competing. Just keep talking to myself and just say silly things and just don't look at anything. And if I do anything good, just say I can do better than that. Ladies 10-pin bowling, even at Anne-Marie's level, doesn't render big money. And with not having a sponsor, she's taking on the men to help pay her way. Five major tournaments a year now for women and there's other little country area ones. And then the men's are a lot more because they get a lot more entries, so the prize money goes up a bit more there. This weekend, Anne-Marie is out to add another cap to her collection, the Australian Open held in Melbourne. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. In the past two years, the number of theatre-goers to the Playhouse has increased by nearly 15,000. This year's program included six major productions, a Midsummer Night's Dream alone attracting an overall audience of 5,500. Despite this, the Hutter Valley Theatre Company has been plagued by financial worries. Council agreed in August to loan the company $70,000 to help with its cash flow problem, but the crunch has come. 
After four years as administrator, Chris Allen planned to leave in December, but the board made his resignation effective from today. Four other staff members have been asked to take leave without pay until January. They're not entirely happy about that, of course, but they're all committed to the company as well and the idea is that we can start afresh next year and present a full year and not have ourselves in debt. However, the company has secured two government grants to keep it afloat for the next three years. While that offers some silver lining, Artistic Director Kingston Anderson says ambitious plans for next year have been cut back. The result of regional theatre being ignored by the federal government in its recent financial injection into the arts. If it's to get bigger and better and more exciting, it does need an injection of more funds, as does the orchestra. Otherwise, we'll only be at half the potential. Three-and-a-half-month-old Benjamin is about to undergo a test that could save him years of discomfort and pain. With the aid of ultrasound, his tiny hip bones are scanned to see if there are signs of any problems. Research shows one in 200 babies suffer dislocations, 4% a lack of growth. Where the babies have been in a uterus where there's too little fluid, the hips can be compressed and they can develop immaturity or dislocation. Benjamin has been given the all clear, but other babies could easily develop walking difficulties requiring surgery. Studies at Newcastle's John Hunter Hospital are allowing for early and less traumatic treatment, picking up problems left undetected by clinical diagnosis. About 40% of dislocations are missed by this clinical testing and most of the immature hips. Um, these can be picked though by ultrasound. There are around 12,000 hip replacement operations a year in Australia. Researchers believe they'll be able to confirm suspected links between osteoarthritis and bone problems during infancy. If it is true that up to 50% of, 50 of these were secondary to hip problems at birth, well that could have a big impact in later life. Melinda Smith, NBN News. It wouldn't be Maitland show without them. These threatening skies have broken intermittently over the past two days, but nothing in the proportions of former years which washed out shows during the month of February. While some came prepared just in case the heavens did open, Maitland Show Society also planned for the worst, or what many would say the inevitable, by taking out rain insurance. Serious stuff, but there is a lighter side to it. So would you consider leasing the Maitland Show to places out west? <laughs> no, I don't think it would happen that way, unfortunately. That would be too easy. Record entries have been received in this year's show jumping events and there's plenty of enthusiasm from local schools, with many of them displaying their artworks, providing their own catering facilities and music. To break even, 15,000 people need to attend the three-day show. So far, 4,000 have gone through the turnstiles. With many special events like the Grand Parade and a fireworks display still to come tonight and tomorrow, Mr Maheen believes the target will be achieved. 